Good day, Grade 12, and welcome to our final examination preparation for Life Sciences for Paper 1. Dear Grade 12 learner, it is important for you to be successful in the NSC examination at the end of 2022. And to achieve this, it will take extra effort and work from you. We have taken time to prepare this kit to enable you to achieve this goal in life sciences. This document has been prepared as study material for the final examinations for Grade 12 Life Sciences. The materials have been arranged in such a way that studying can be undertaken topic-wise. Within each topic, core notes have been included according to the 2021 Examination Guideline document. Questions were selected such that the core concepts and core skills are assessed and practiced. The action words have been underlined in the questions so that you can follow the instructions of each question. If we look at the distribution of topics for Paper 1, you know Paper 1 constitutes 150 marks. And the topics that make up Paper 1 are Reproduction in vertebrates, 8 out of the 150 marks. Human reproduction, which would be 41 out of the 150 marks. Responding to the environment, that includes the structure and function of the brain, structure and function of the eye, and structure and function of the ear makes up 54 of the 150 marks. A whopping 36% of paper 1 is dedicated to this topic. We also have responding to the environment plants. Those are your plant hormones and their functions, 13 marks. And then endocrine system and homeostasis makes up 34 of the 150 marks. So these different topics will be examined and assessed in paper one with the different weightings making up 150 marks. If we look at the format of the examination papers, your paper is made up of two sections. Section A, which is question one, is made up of a variety of short answer questions. Example 1.1 are your multiple choice questions. 1.2 are your terminology questions. 1.3, your column statement questions. And then you may have further subsections, which is made up of data response questions, making up 50 of the 150 marks. Section B is made up of two questions. Question 2, which is 150 marks, can consist of four to five subsections. Question 3, 50 marks, also made up of four to six subsections. So question 1, 50 marks, question 2, 50 marks, and question 3, 50 marks makes up your 150 marks for paper one. If we look at the instructions and information of each paper, remember in life sciences we do not have any choice questions, so you need to answer all the questions in each paper, and the questions can be answered in any order. Number your answers correctly according to the numbering system used in the question paper. Example, if question 1.1 is made up of 10 multiple choice questions, you will number it 1.1.1 up until 1.1.10. Present your answers according to the instructions of each question. If you are asked to describe the process of hearing, you cannot present your answer in the form of a diagram, a table or a flowchart. You will forfeit all your marks. So please read the instructional verb of each question. Do all drawings in pencil and label them in blue or black ink. So ensure that you have a pen, P, 
pencil and a ruler, as you might be asked to make a drawing. Draw diagrams, tables or flowcharts only when asked to do so, or else you will forfeit the marks. In life sciences, we do not use graph paper. Very important, grade 12. Ensure that you have a non-programmable calculator so that you can do any calculations. A protractor and a compass in case you are asked to draw a pie chart or a circle diagram. And ensure that you have a ruler. And then very important, grade 12, write neatly and legibly. Some more exam tips. Section A, question 1. And the instruction to question 1.1 will read, Various options are provided as possible answers to the following questions. Choose the answer and write only the letter A to D next to the question number in the answer book. An example of a paper 1 multiple choice question. 1.1.1 the gland involved in regulating the salt content of the body. So when answering a multiple choice question in section A, you read the question and the four options very carefully. Evaluate each option and eliminate each incorrect option. And then very important grade 12, only one option must be written down. So if we look at this example, the gland, they want to know a gland involved in regulating the salt content. So you should know which hormone regulates the salt content, and that would be aldosterone. Which gland secretes aldosterone? Is it the pancreas? No. Is it the hypothalamus? No. Is it the pituitary? No. Yes, it is the adrenal gland. So my answer to 1.1.1 would be D. If we look at our 1.2 questions, question 1, 1.2, and the instruction read as follows. Give the correct biological term for each of the following descriptions. Write only the term next to the question numbers in the answer book. Please ensure grade 12, make sure of the correct spelling of your biological terms. Example, glucagon and glycogen. Um, use scientific terminology and not common terminology. And be careful of terms that sound alike like corpus luteum and corpus callosum, carion and choroid. So be very careful in this section and ensure that you write it down correct. Section A, question 1, 1.3. And the instruction reads, indicate whether each of the statements in column 1 apply to A only, B only, both A and B, or none of the items in column 2. Write A only, B only, both A and B, or none next to the question number. And here is an example of a paper 1, column 1, column 2. So in column 1, we have a statement, plant defense mechanism. In column 2, we have two items, A thorns, B chemicals. So you go to A thorns. Is thorns a plant defense mechanism? Yes, it is. So I put a tick next to it. Are chemicals plant defense mechanisms? Yes, they are. Remember, this is basic knowledge. So both A and B applies to the statement. So my correct answer would be both A and B. So please read and follow the instructions of a question. Example, in the statement item questions, the answer should be written as A only, B only, both A and B, not A plus B, A, B, A and B, or A, B. In questions that require only a letter, 
you only need to write down a letter. Example, give only the letter of the part of the brain that interprets sound. So you should know which part of the brain interprets sound. And obviously here you would have been given a diagram. It's the cerebrum. Go and identify the cerebrum, the letter that corresponds with the cerebrum, and write down the letter only and not the word cerebrum. Other questions might require you to write down both the letter and your name. Example, give the letter and name of the part that transmits impulses away from the cell body in the diagram. So, which part of a neuron transmit impulses away? From our basic knowledge, we should know it's an axon. So you go to the diagram, identify the axon, look at the letter that corresponds to the axon, write down the letter and the term axon. I hope, grade 12, that these general exam tips will be useful to you when you prepare for your final NSC examination. Our first topic that we will go through is human reproduction. And as previously mentioned, human reproduction will be part of paper one and it will make up 41 marks out of your 150 marks. Now, what do I need to know for this section? It is important that you can label and provide functions of the different parts of the male and the female reproductive system. And remember, there are some good diagrams, and here's a very good diagram that gives you the structure of the male reproductive system as well as the function. So please make sure that you know each part of the male reproductive system and its corresponding function. Also ensure that you know the functions of the hormone testosterone. Of course, you could be asked this in an examination. A possible question in the NSC exams, describe, and please take note, describe is the action verb, the process of spermatogenesis. And we should know spermatogenesis is the formation of male gametes or sperm cells. And the only thing that you need to write down for this process is under the influence of testosterone, so the hormone, identify the hormone testosterone, where does it take place? Diploid cells in the seminiferous tubules of the testes. What happens there? It undergoes meiosis, so the type of cell division is meiosis. And what is the product of spermatogenesis to form haploid sperm cells? So first of all, the hormone involved in spermatogenesis, and in this case, testosterone, where does it take place? And how, meaning what type of cell division takes place? And what is the product? It is also very important that you can draw the structure of a sperm cell and provide labels and functions of the different parts. This is a very easy diagram, so please ensure that you know a sperm cell is made up of three parts, a head, a midsection, and a tail. And in my head, I find my acrosome. Please ensure you know the function of the acrosome, my nucleus, that contains my genetic material, 23 chromosomes. That is also the part that will be injected into the ovum during fertilization. In my midsection, I find lots of organelles, mitochondria. Why? It provides energy for swimming. And then I have this long tail that is used for swimming. So please make sure you know the diagram, you can draw the diagram, you know the labels, and you know the functions. Because you could be asked to explain how the sperm cell is adapted for certain functions. And if you know your basic knowledge, the question becomes quite easy. 
If we look at the female reproductive system, once again, yeah, you know, need to know the different parts and functions. And the parts that you need to know as a grade 12 are the functions of the ovaries, the functions of the fallopian tubes, that is the site of fertilization. You also know to know the uterus and its functions. The lining, inner lining of the uterus is called the endometrium. The opening between the uterus and the vagina, known as the cervix, and then the vagina and its functions. And once again, as in the male system, you must be able to describe oogenesis. Right, and if we look at oogenesis, it's the formation of female gametes. But where does it take place? Diploid cells in the ovary undergo mitosis. And what happens at the end of mitosis? Numerous follicles are formed. And once puberty is reached, under the influence of FSH, one cell inside the follicle enlarges and undergoes meiosis. And what is the end product of meiosis? Four cells produce and only one survives to form a haploid ovum. Take note of the words in bold because those are very important. Grade 12, you should also be able to draw the structure of an ovum and provide labels. And the labels that you need to know, according to the exam guideline, is a nucleus. And you have your cytoplasm and it is surrounded by a jelly layer. Very, very simplified diagram. You also need to identify labels if you get a cross section of the ovary indicating the development of the follicles. And here you can see, if I can just get a pointer, you have your primary follicles. And as they develop, they secrete the different hormones. We will get to that. And eventually the follicles mature and now it is called a mature graphene follicle. A very important process takes place in the menstrual cycle called ovulation, meaning the release of a ripe ovum. And once the ovum has been released, the empty follicle is now known as a corpus luteum. And here you can see fertilization did not take place. Why? And very distinct characteristic here is that your corpus luteum disintegrated or it became smaller, which is an indication that fertilization did not take place. Grade 12, you must know the names and functions of the following hormones that play a role in the menstrual cycle. And the four hormones involved in the menstrual start cycle are FSH, follicle stimulating hormone. It's good to know the name because then you would know the function as well. LH, estrogen and progesterone. The very first two hormones, FSH and LH, are secreted by the hypothesis or the pituitary gland that is situated below the brain. And you must know the function. What does FSH do? So it's secreted by the hypothesis, but its target organ are the follicles. So it stimulates the development of a primary follicle into a mature graphene follicle. So if this FSH, your follicles will develop. And while your follicles are developing, they secrete estrogen. LH, and you can use the abbreviation LH in the exam, also secreted by the hypothesis, has two functions. It stimulates ovulation. Remember, hormones stimulate or inhibit, so it stimulates ovulation, meaning the release of a ripe ovum, 
and it also stimulates the formation of the corpus luteum. Estrogen. Now, very important to note, grade 12s, as, as the follicles start to develop, they secrete estrogen. Once you have your ripe follicle, your graphene follicle, that's when most of your estrogen is secreted. So once the follicles start developing, there will be an increase in estrogen. And what is the function of estrogen? The target organ is the endometrium. And what does it do in the uterus? It starts the thickening or stimulates the thickening of the endometrium, preparing the uterus for implantation. Now, once the graphene follicle released the egg cell during ovulation, that is when estrogen will start decreasing. And now it is known as a corpus luteum. And the function of the corpus luteum is to secrete progesterone. And what is the function of progesterone? Target organ is also the uterus and it maintains the thickening of the endometrium. So very important to know these four hormones involved in the menstrual cycle the gland that secrete the hormones and their functions. And this is a very good table to memorize these hormones involved in the menstrual cycle. Right, if we look at the events in the ovarian, very important to note grade 12, in females we have a menstrual cycle that is made up of two cycles, an ovarian cycle, that means part of the cycle that takes place in the ovary and part of the cycle takes place in the uterus, known as the uterine cycle. So let's look at the ovarian cycle. First, we have the development of the follicles up until the graphene follicle. Then we have ovulation, the release of a ripe ovum, and then we have the formation of the corpus luteum. So there we have, as our follicles start developing, it secretes the, under the influence of FSH, these follicles secrete estrogen. So estrogen will start increasing. Here we have, then we have LH being secreted by the hypothesis, and LH stimulates ovulation, the release of a ripe ovum. Once ovulation has taken place, the follicle is now known as a corpus luteum, and the function of the corpus luteum is to secrete progesterone. If we look at the events in the uterine cycle, in the uterine cycle, that means what takes place in the uterus. We're looking at the changes that take place in the thickness of the endometrium, as well as the process of menstruation. Right, so the estrogen that is secreted by the follicles is responsible for the thickening of the endometrium. So the endometrium will start preparing itself for pregnancy and become thicker. Once there's no more estrogen, because remember the graphene follicle burst open, it is now progesterone that thickens the endometrium even more. And if your fertilization does not take place, Corpus luteum will disintegrate, meaning progesterone will decrease, and that leads to menstruation. The blood vessel rich endometrium breaks down, and bleeding occurs through the vagina. So remember, menstruation is just part of the uterine cycle, which is part of the menstrual cycle. So progesterone will decrease 
if fertilization does not occur and how do we know that fertilization has not occurred we can look at the size of the corpus luteum if it remains the same size meaning fertilization took place meaning progesterone will remain constant or increase if the corpus luteum becomes smaller or disintegrates progesterone levels will decrease and menstruation will occur and there you can see if fertilization does occur progesterone re levels remain high the endometrium will remain intact and no menstruation will occur and please this is very important if you understand this you'll be able to answer any question on the hormonal control of the menstrual cycle there is a negative feedback between progesterone and fsh so if fertilization takes place progesterone levels remain high meaning the hormone fsh will not be secreted by the hypothesis or it is inhibited inhibited means it's slowed down it's not secreted and no follicle will develop meaning no ovulation will take place if progesterone levels decrease meaning no fertilization took place FSH will be stimulated or secreted by the hypothesis and new follicles will start. If we look at the process of fertilization and you should know the definition of fertilization, it's the fusion of a haploid sperm cell with a haploid ovum to form a fertilized egg cell known as a zygote you should also be know or describe the development of the zygote up until the embryo so once the zygote has taken place that is now a diploid cell it will grow by the process of mitosis until a ball of cells is formed and the ball of cells is called the marula the marula will continually divide by mitosis to form a hollow ball of cells look there the structure there's a hollow inside the ball of cells and this is known as a blastula or a blastocyst please note not a blastocyte as this is a cell Let's have a look at some past exam questions on human reproduction. The diagram below shows structures formed during human reproduction. And here we are given four distinct structures. And from your basic knowledge, you should know here I have a hollow ball of cells. So I will label this one blastula. Here I have two cells. So that should be my zygote. Here I have a ball of cells. So that should be my marula. And this is a diagram of a sperm cell. And please make sure that you can identify a the acrosome b the nucleus and c the mitochondria so a useful tip grade 12 is to fill in all the labels all the information that you already know it just makes it easier when you get to the questions so let's have a look at the question first question identify part a meaning you must just give the name of part a and if you look at part a it is acrosome so all you have to do is just write down acrosome 4.2 name the organelle found in part c so they're not asking you what part c is they want to name the organelle in part c and that would be your mitochondria 4.3 give the number one two three or four 
of the diagram that represents the following. A, the marula. Now, what, remember what I said as a tip? You write down your labels before the time, before looking at your questions. So which one of these represent the marula? So you should know the marula is a ball of cells. So it is number three. The number of the structure that will implant in the uterus, and you should know the blastula or blastocyst implants in the uterus. So that would be number one. They want the number of the diagram that represents the blastula or blastocyst, and that would also be number one. 4.4. Give the letter and name of the part that will enter the ovum during fertilization. Now remember, fertilization is when a sperm cell and an ovum fuse. But remember, it's not the whole sperm that enters the egg cell. The acrosome breaks down the membrane of the egg cell and injects the nucleus, the genetic material, into the ovum. So it would be the letter, it would be B, and the name would be the nucleus. Name the type of cell division that occurred to produce the structure in diagram 3 from a zygote. Remember our development of the embryo. Zygote develops by the process of mitosis. So it is mitosis. More cells develop. And there we have our answers to the previous questions. In case you missed it while we went through it. Another question here, we have a question on the male reproductive system. Now, once again, grade 12s, have a look at the diagram and make sure you can identify the labels on the diagram before looking at the questions. And remember, please read your STEM, male reproductive system. So I know that would be my testis E. This duct going here would be my vas deferens C or my sperm duct. It then goes through the different glands, my culpus gland, my prostate gland. It then goes into the penis and the duct is now known as the urethra that enters the penis that will be used in copulation. So let's have, so I filled in all my labels. Now I go to the questions. Question 1.1. Give the letter and name of the part used in copulation. What is copulation? It's the transfer of sperm from the male to the female. So what part is used for the transfer? And it is A, the penis. One mark for A and one mark for penis. So please make sure you read your instruction carefully. Letter and name. Give the letter and name of the part that produces testosterone. And I know testosterone is produced in my testes. So my letter is E, one mark. Testes, one mark. 1.2. Give only letters of two parts in the diagram that contribute to the formation of semen. So you should know what semen is. Semen is your sperm cells plus your seminal fluid constitutes your semen. So any two parts that constitute to semen, it would be E, F, and D. You can write down any two of those three parts because E will give you your sperm cells, F will give you seminal fluid, and D will give you seminal fluid, and your sperm and your seminal fluid constitutes semen. Provide a passage for the sperm cells. That would be two parts, meaning a duct that can transfer. It, it would be where is it? C and B. 
I hope that question was easy for you. And there we have it. Right, our next question, we are looking at the structure of the female reproductive system. And remember, it's not male, it's female. Once again, I identify all my labels. So A would be my fallopian tube, B would be my ovary, C would be my uterus because it's on the outside. Remember, my endometrium is on the inside. And D is my cervix, meaning my opening between my uterus and my vagina. Right, identify part D, cervix. State one function of part A. What's the function of the fallopian tube? It is the site of fertilization, or the site meaning the place where fertilization takes place. Or it is a passageway for the ova to move in, or a passageway for the sperm cell, or you could say a passageway for the gametes to move. 2.3. Describe the process of oogenesis as it occurs in part B, and it's only four marks. Which hormone is involved under the influence of FSH? Remember, diploid cells, if we can just go there to the answer, diploid cells first undergo mitosis to form numerous follicles, and then the, under the influence of FSH, one of the follicles undergoes meiosis to form a haploid ovum. A person undergoes a surgical operation to remove part B. So part B is my ovary because I've written it in there on both sides. So if both my ovaries are removed, you need to explain, explain, give a cause and effect. So what is the cause and effect if your ovaries are removed? Why this person will not menstruate? Why will this person not menstruate if this is removed? And there I can see um, because ovulation will not take place. And if ovulation does not take place, there will be no new follicles. Ovulation will take not take place. No estrogen will be secreted to thicken the endometrium and therefore menstruation will not take place. I've missed question 2.4. They say state one way in which structure C, the uterus, is suited for its function during pregnancy. Remember, they are not asking you the function of the uterus. So you cannot say for implantation, how is it suited for um, to help with birth? It is muscular. Are you with me? It can contract and relax during childbirth. So there we have our answer to question 2.5. If the ovaries, both ovaries are removed, no follicles can develop, no estrogen will be secreted and the endometrium will not thicken, therefore no menstruation. And then very important, grade 12, today we did not look at reproduction in vertebrates. We only looked at human reproduction. Please remember in your exam guidelines, use your exam guidelines very, very effectively because it tells you exactly what you need to study in human reproduction as well as in reproduction in vertebrates. So use your exam guidelines effectively for consolidation of topics. And then very important, as soon as you've completed a section, you've studied a section, make a tick next to it and make sure you go through all the different parts that is in the exam guideline. Responding to the environment, humans. Now remember, this topic includes the brain structure and functions, the structure and functions of the eye, as well as the structure and functions of the ear. And you know, responding to the environment is found in paper one, and it makes up 54 of the 150 marks. So it is worthwhile to study this 
topic or the section of paper one. If we look at the human nervous system, it tells us why it is important to have a human nervous system. Now, very important, you should know the difference between a stimulus and an impulse. What is a stimulus? It is any change in the environment, whether it is loud noise, a light, anything that changes, temperature, if it changes, it is a stimulus. An impulse is a message carried by our nerves. So impulses are transmitted. Okay. Then once again, make sure you know the structure of the nervous system. Now remember here we are just looking at the central nervous system, but you should also know the different parts of the nervous system. Although we are only looking at the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord, make sure you know the components of the rest of the nervous system, the peripheral nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. Make sure you have a good diagram. Here we have a section through the brain. So we're looking at the central nervous system, which is made up of the brain and the spinal cord. And once again, make sure you know the different parts, the largest part known as my cerebrum, and then very important, the functions of the cerebrum. The smallest part here at the back of the cranium, known as the cerebellum, and make sure you know the functions of that. And just as a note, in the cerebrum, there you can see it controls voluntary actions, but my cerebellum coordinates voluntary actions. So please note that difference. You will also know that the hemispheres, Remember, the cerebrum is made up of two hemispheres joined by this white fibrous tissue known as the corpus callosum. Do not confuse corpus callosum with corpus luteum, which is the yellow body found in the ovary. Then I have my medulla oblongata, and very important, there you can see it controls heartbeat and breathing. I have my pituitary gland or my apophysis and please note the position of the hypothalamus which controls hunger, thirst, body temperature and emotions. So please make sure you study a cross section through the central nervous system. Please make sure you know each part and their respective functions. Also ensure that you know the functions of the spinal cord. It's a pathway for nerve impulses to and from the brain. And then very important, it controls your reflex actions. The protection of the central nervous system, which is the brain and the spinal cord. Remember, it is enclosed by a bony skull also known as the cranium, your spinal cord enclosed by the vertebral column. And then both your brain and your spinal cord are enclosed by three membranes and the collective names of the three membranes are called meninges. You do not need to know the individual names of the meninges. It is also surrounded, the brain and the spinal cord, surrounded by a cerebrospinal fluid that helps with protection. Then we go on to our nerve cells, which are known as neurons. You must be able to draw and label a simple neuron. And please make sure that only the following labels are included, or the following labels is what you need to know. Your nucleus, and please note your nucleus that is inside your cell body, and you have your cytoplasm surrounding the nucleus in the cell body. You have your dendrites, which are your short outgrowths that transmit impulses to the cell body. 
you have your long axon. They are outgrowths that transmit impulses away from the cell body. Note the direction of the impulse goes from dendrite cell body to the axon. And then your axon is usually covered with a myelin sheath. Please make sure that you know your different types of neurons. Your sensory neuron, and what do they do? Transmit impulses from your receptors to your central nervous system. And in a reflex arc, they are usually found in the dorsal, dorsal meaning the top root. So in the top part of your Spinal cord, known as your dorsal root, that is where you will find your sensory neuron. Your interneurons are usually found inside the spinal cord and they connect your sensory neuron to your motor neuron. And then your motor neurons, they transmit impulses from the central nervous system or the spinal cord to the effector which could be your muscle or your gland. So very important, make sure you know the difference between a receptor, it recepts, a detects a stimulus, and a effector that reacts to an impulse. Receptors, they are specialized cells that detect stimuli and convert it to an impulse. It is then transmitted with your different neurons. And what does your effector do? It reacts or responds to a impulse. Example, your muscles or your glands. You should also know the difference between a reflex action and a reflex arc. Now, what is a reflex action? It is quick. It is automatic movement or action by an effector in response to a stimulus. So there you have the stimulus of heat. So it is a quick action where you pull away the finger, okay, the muscles in the finger, in reaction to a stimulus. Example, pulling your hand away from a hot stove. Now, what is a reflex arc? The path in which nerve impulses are carried from the receptor right through the spinal cord to the effector to bring about a reflex action is known as a reflex arc. And you must know the different parts of a reflex arc. There's a receptor. Receptors normally detect stimuli and convert it to a nerve impulse. The nerve impulse are transmitted with sensory neurons to the central nervous system. The interneuron joins the sensory neuron to a motor neuron, and a motor neuron transmits impulses to the effector, and effectors bring about the response. Why are reflex actions important? They protect the body from dangerous situations and from serious further injury. Right, we've already said that they protect our body. What is a synapse? The microscopic gap. Now remember we have our nerve cells and between our nerves we have what we call a microscopic gap which is known as a synapse. And what is the function of that synapse? It ensures that impulses travel. So if this is the direction of my impulse, that means impulses will travel in one direction only from the dendrite to the Axon. You should also know for grade 12 purposes the diseases or disorders associated with the central nervous system, and there are two disorders that you need to know Alzheimer's, meaning it's the degeneration of brain cells that destroys memory and thinking, and multiple sclerosis, where the myelin sheath that covers your nerve cells are damaged making it difficult for impulses to 
be transmitted, meaning you're going to have slower impulses. Right, let's consolidate and have a look at some of your questions. The diagram below represents a human brain. And once again, as in previous videos, I've told you what, if you are given a diagram, ensure that you put in the labels. Remember, it's a human brain. So I go and look for my cerebrum, the largest part. So B would be my cerebrum. That A would be me, a little gland below the brain. That would be my pituitary gland or my hypothesis. C, I can see joins. The, it's a white fibrous tissue that joins the two hemispheres. So C would be my corpus callosum. D is my smaller part of the brain, known as my cerebellum. And E would be known, it's below my medulla oblongata, so E would be my spinal cord. Give the letter and name of the part responsible for memorizing a cell phone number. Remember, Part of the brain responsible for memory is my cerebrum. So which part, which letter corresponds with my cerebrum? B, cerebrum. The letter and name that coordinates voluntary movements. Remember, cerebrum controls voluntary movements, but it is coordinated by my cerebellum. Corresponding letter D, cerebrum. Bellum. Secretion of hormones and the endocrine gland here is A, hypothesis or pituitary gland. Connection of two hemispheres of part B, that would be C, corpus callosum. The reflex action that occurs when stepping barefooted on a sharp object, that would be E, my spinal cord. And there I have my answers to the question. Here I have another question. And here I can see the diagram below represents the structure of a neuron. So first of all, I know you get different types of neurons. So I need to identify what type of neuron is this. If the cell body is here at the end, I know it is a motor neuron because my sensory neuron has its cell body in the center. So I identify my parts, the short outgrowths A are dendrites, my B is my nucleus, E is my cell body, F is my cytoplasm, C would be my axon, and D would be my myelin sheet. I've written that in. Now I look at my questions. Name the type of neuron, and I know it is a motor neuron. Identify part B because I've already written it in, it becomes easy. B nucleus. F cytoplasm. A dendrites. Give the letter and name of the part that transmit impulses away from the cell body. And I know that is my axon. So my letter of my axon would be C axon. Insulates and speeds up the transmission of impulses. That's the function of my myelin sheet. So now I know if ever asked in the exam, name two functions of the myelin sheet. It insulates meaning encloses, and speeds up the transmission of impulses. So that would be D, myelin sheet. Name the condition caused by the progressive degradation. Degradation means the breakdown of part D. My myelin sheet breaks down. It leads to multiple sclerosis. And there I have my answers to question 1.1.
Right, the next part of responding to the environment, we are looking at the structure and functions of the human eye. Now, once again, grade 12, I will not go through each and every function and part, but you need to know this diagram very well. So know the structure and function of the human eye and you know it or study it using a diagram and here's a very good diagram that gives you each and every part with its function so this is basic knowledge that you need to know you should also know the difference between the processes that take place within the eye and one of them you should know the difference between eye accommodation that's got to do with distance and pupillary mechanism that's got to do with light conditions. So what is accommodation? It's the adjustment or the change in the shape of the lens. So if you look at the lens, remember we know in humans you have a biconvex lens. So if that lens would change its shape to see objects clearly, whether they are far away or close by. So if you compare the shape of the lens in these two diagrams, distant vision, we normally speak of objects further than six meters, and near vision, we refer to objects that are closer than six meters. And I always tell learners, study one of them. Look at the shape of the lens, because that would give you an indication whether we are talking of distant vision, here you can see the lens is flatter or less, oh sorry, less convex. And here the lens is rounder, meaning it is more convex. Please, the lens cannot ch change its shape from convex to concave. So please be very careful. The shape of the lens, lens is number one, it is transparent and it has a biconvex shape meaning it is rounded on both sides. So there you know, so how do I get a flatter or a less convex lens? There are three things involved in eye accommodation. It's the lens, the suspensory ligaments that holds the lens in position, and the ciliary muscles that are situated here in the ciliary body. Those three structures are involved in eye accommodation. So to get a flatter lens, what needs to happen? These ciliary muscles relax. And if they relax, my suspensory ligaments become taut or tight. Remember, they are ligaments. They cannot contract and relax. Muscles contract and relax. Ligaments either become tight or they slacken, okay? So my suspensory ligaments become taut or tight, and if they become tight, they pull the lens upwards and downwards, meaning my lens becomes less, so the tension on the lens increases, and the lens becomes flatter or less convex. Light rays are then bent less, and they are focused on the retina and the opposite happens for near vision to get a rounder more convex lens ciliary muscles contract and remember these work antagonistic meaning opposite so suspensory ligaments slacken and if they slacken tension on the lens decreases and the lens becomes more rounded or more convex and light rays are bent more to focus on the retina. So please make sure that you know the shape of the lens for distant and for near vision. The next process that you need to know that takes place in the eye is pupillary mechanism. And here the stimulus is light. Whether we are looking at bright light, notice the size of the pupil, or whether we're looking at dim light, 
notice the size of the pupil. Pupil widens and here the pupil becomes smaller or constricts. Right, so let's look at the, what happens during bright light conditions. Now remember our pupil is controlled by the iris. So the iris actually controls the amount of light that enters the eye. And in the iris, I have two sets of muscles. I have radial muscles and circular muscles. Please do not confuse circular muscles with ciliary muscles that is involved in eye accommodation. So radial muscles are those muscles in the iris, they relax. If they relax, the circular muscles contract. Once again, an opposite effect. What happens to the pupil? It becomes smaller or it constricts. And if it constricts, less light enters the eye. In dim light, what happens to the pupil? It becomes bigger or it widens. So what happens here? Radial muscles, these muscles contract, meaning my circular muscles relax, my pupil widens or so gets bigger, and if it's bigger, more light enters the eye. Let's consolidate these two processes of eye accommodation and pupil mechanism by looking at past exam papers. The diagram below show parts of the eye under different conditions. Now, if I look at this diagram, I can see my pupil is smaller, constricted. Here I have a pupil that is large or wide. Here I have a constricted pupil and a wide pupil. If I look at the shape of my lens, here I have a flatter lens. So already I should know this is um, distant vision. Distant vision, I have a rounder lens or more convex lens. This is near vision. 1.4.1 Name the process that occurs when the curvature of the lens changes to focus on near or distant objects. So we're looking at distance. What process is involved when we look at distance? Accommodation. Name the process when the pupil size changes to regulate the amount of light. So my stimulus is light and the process involved in light is pupillary mechanism. Now, give the letters of two diagrams. I've got four diagrams, A, B, C, D, that represent the condition of an eye of a person in dim light. So I should know in dim light, I'm going to have a wide pupil. Isn't it so? To let more light in. So looking for a wide pupil would be B and D. Focusing on a distant object and from a basic knowledge that I've studied, distant object meaning my lens is flatter or less convex. So it is A and B compared to C and D. Give the letters of two diagrams that represent the eye of a person whose Ciliary muscles, where do I get ciliary muscles? Ciliary muscles are involved in eye accommodation. And when my ciliary muscles contract, my suspensory ligaments slacken, meaning the tension on my lens decrease and my lens becomes more round. So it would be C and D. When the radial muscles are relaxed and remember when my radial muscles are relaxed my circular muscles contract and if my circular muscles contract my lens actually becomes more or less a uh, sorry becomes smaller sorry and my correct answer here is a and c because you can see the pupil is smaller not my lens, but my pupil size decrease. 
The diagrams below show the response of the human eye to two different conditions. Once again, remember, light, pupillary mechanism, dis, um, distance, we're talking about eye accommodation. So I look at my diagram, what is given to me? Here I have a white pupil and it becomes smaller. So what, make, so what process is involved here? Pupil mechanism. Here I have a flat lens and it becomes rounder, so I know it is eye accommodation. Identify part A, so I look at the structure of my eye. Remember the outer layer of my eye before it becomes transparent, that would be the transparent layer B. Sorry, that would be my cornea, but that would be the white part of the eye known as the sclera. B would be my lens, and C would be my ciliary body containing my ciliary muscle. So identify part A would be my sclera. B, lens, C, ciliary body or ciliary muscle. Because it's very difficult here to see whether it's the muscle or the body. But remember, the ciliary body contains the ciliary muscle. Identify the process in diagram one. So what process is involved in the pupil changing its size? Pupillary mechanism. Name the part of the eye responsible for the response. Which part of the eye causes the pupil to become wider and smaller? That is the iris. And then state the consequence to the person's vision if the process in diagram 2 does not occur. So if the lens remains flat, you will not be able... So that means you can't see... This is for far vision. You will only be see. The consequence is that you will not be able to see near objects. Right. There you can see near vision will be blurred. Only distance objects will be clearly visible. Another question on the eye, structure and function of the eye. The diagram below represents the structure of the human eye. And once again, I'm given labels. Make sure you know your labels. So I go look. Remember, my eye is made up of three layers. The outer layer, B, is my sclera. Middle layer, my choroid. And then my inner layer is my retina. And part of the retina here at the back is my yellow spot or my fovea. There I have my blind spot. These would be my suspensory ligaments, my lens, and that would be my iris. Identify part C, and if I look clearly here, part C is the middle layer, which is the choroid. Please do not confuse choroid with chorion. Give one function of part E. My suspensory ligaments, what do they do? They hold my lens in position. State why the clearest image will form when light rays fall on part D. Why would the clearest image be? What does part D contain? It contains mostly cones. Remember, not rods and cones. It contains only cones. Cones, and that is why you have the clearest image there. Or you could say it contains the photoreceptors that will be accepted, but the correct answer is it contains only cones. Explain. Give a reason for your answer in which part B, the sclera, is structurally different from part F, the lens. How are they different in structure? Give a reason. So if we say F we know is transparent, why is it transparent? To allow light through. B is white or it is opaque, meaning it's not transparent, to maintain the shape of the eye. And there you have your four marks. Describe how the muscles in part A function to increase the amount of light entering the eye. When is the 
To increase the amount of light entering the eye, you need a wider pupil. And how am I going to get a wider pupil? There we go, to, um, 2 to 5. Circular muscles must relax. Radial muscles contract, causing the pupil to dilate or to widen. Describe how a blurred image forms if a person with normal vision wears spectacles with biconvex lenses while reading a book. Remember, so your lens in your spectacle, if I have a lens here with biconvex, so my lens in my spectacle will refract. Remember, refract meaning bend, bend the light rays. And then, so that spectacle lens will bend the light rays. My lens will bend, the lens of the eye will refract the light rays even more. Meaning the light rays will focus here in front of the retina causing a blurred image. The last part of responding to the environment is the human ear. Now remember, your ear houses your receptors that are sensitive for hearing, but also play an important role in the maintenance, maintenance of balance in our bodies. So the ear has two functions, hearing and balance. And once again, as with the eye and the brain, know your different parts and their respective functions. Your outer ear made up of the inner and the ear canal. Your middle ear made up of the tympanic membrane, your ossicles, your oval window with your round window and your eustachian tube. And then your inner ear made up of your semicircular canals with your fluid containing your cochlea that has your receptors for hearing, your organ of corti, as well as your auditory nerve. And make sure you know the functions of each and every part. How does hearing take place? Now, very important. You need to understand the difference between sound waves, vibrations, and pressure waves. So what does our pinhead do? It collects sound waves and directs it towards the ear canal. As that sound waves hit the tympanic membrane, it causes the tympanic membrane to vibrate. So in the inner ear, you have vibrations being passed from the different ossicles to amplify the vibrations onto the oval window. The oval window vibrates and what does it cause? It causes pressure waves in the inner ear, meaning the endolymph and the perilymph start moving, causing pressure waves. That stimulus is converted to an impulse in the organ of corti and it is transmitted with the auditory nerve because it's hearing to the cerebrum that interprets hearing. And there we have the description of the hearing process. I will not go through that now. You can study that. Balance. And we know it's the inner ear that is responsible for balance. So how is the human ear responsible for balance? In my inner ear, I have two types of receptors. I have crystal in the semicircular canals and I have macula in the sacculus and the utriculus. They detect, st sorry, stimuli and they convert it to a impulse. Now what stimuli does the crystal detect? Any change in direction and speed of movement is detected by crystal. Any change in the position of the head, the macula are stimulated. They, when they are stimulated, they convert the stimulus to a nerve impulse. The nerve impulse goes with the auditory nerve and very important, not to the brain. Which part of the brain you need to be very specific? 
the cerebellum interprets the impulse and sends impulses to the muscles to restore balance. This is very, very important when you need to describe balance, grade 12. Please make sure you know which receptors are stimulated. They convert that stimulus to an impulse. It goes with the auditory nerve to the cerebellum, which then sends an impulse to the muscles to restore the balance. This last part is equally important. Then we also need to know disorders of the ear, middle ear infection caused by excess fluid in the middle ear due to infection. And how is it treated? We insert a little tube-like structure called grommets, and the grommets are inserted into the tympanic membrane to drain the fluid. Deafness, it could be injury to any part of the ear, and that would be the treatment for deafness. Now let's look at some past questions on the ear. The diagram below represents part of the human ear with a middle ear infection. So once again, I fill in my labels. Pinna, my ear canal, my tympanic membrane or my eardrum. Here, they refer to the ossicles. They don't want the individual names. I have my oval window on top with my round window with my eustachian tube. There I have my semicircular canals with my cochlea with my auditory nerve. Identify part B, ear canal. D, ossicles. They're not asking us for the individual bones. They want the collective name, the ossicles. State one function of part A. What's the function of the pinna? collect sound waves and direct it towards the ear canal. Let's have a look at another question. The diagram below show different parts of the brain and ear. So here I have structure of the brain, cerebrum, the medulla oblongata with my cerebellum. I have a structure of the middle ear, which houses my semicircular canals with my cochlea. I have the structure of the middle ear, so that would be my tympanic membrane with my ossicles, with my oval window, my round window, and my eustachian tube. Identify part A, cerebrum, B, medulla oblongata, H, eustachian tube. Give letter and name of the part of the ear that absorbs excess pressure waves from the inner ear. And from your basic knowledge, you should know it's G, the round window. Name the receptors found at part E. The receptors in the cochlea is called my organ of corti or my hair cells. Explain why damage to part B. So I know it's my medulla oblongata, can lead to instant death. So here they're actually testing whether you know the functions of the medulla oblongata. So explain, it controls heart beat and breathing. So if it is damaged, your heart will stop and you will stop breathing. Describe how part C, which is part C, the cerebellum, responds to impulses received from body. So they're not saying describe the whole balance. How does the cerebellum respond? So the impulse is already there. How does this respond? It sends impulses to the, it interprets the impulses and sends impulses to the skeletal muscles to restore balance. In older people, part F, that is the oval window, may harden. Explain how this condition may lead to hearing loss. So if this hardens, remember the function of the oval window is to vibrate and cause pressure waves. So if it hardens, 
there will either be less or no vibrations, there will be less or no pressure waves in the inner ear, there will either be less stimulation or no stimulation of the organ of corti, and less or no impulses will go to the auditory nerve, which either leads to no hearing or less hearing. And then 2.2, describe accommodation for distant vision. So you need to describe what happens during distant vision. Remember your diagram, visualize your diagram. How does my lens look for distant vision? My lens must be flatter and less convex to get that. My suspensory ligaments must tighten or become taut, meaning my ciliary muscles relax, suspensory ligaments become tight, tension on the lens increases and the lens becomes flatter or less convex. There I have my answers to the previous question. And I will allow you time to either screenshot this, capture it, or just take it in. Once again, I've included the exam guideline for responding to the environment. Remember, you only really finish studied once you've been through every single part of the exam guideline. So please use your exam guideline effectively for consolidation of topics. I just went through the main ideas and not through everything. So please ensure that you use your exam guideline effectively. And when a section is completed, indicate it with a tick. Today we are going to have a look at the topic endocrine system and homeostasis. And as we know by now, this is part of paper one, and this constitutes 34 of the 150 marks in paper one. So let's get right into it. You need to know the difference between an endocrine gland and an exocrine gland. Remember in the previous chapter, we looked at the nervous system. Here we are looking at the endocrine system. So what is an endocrine gland? They are ductless glands that release hormones directly into the bloodstream. So they do not release it into ducts. Examples are your ovaries, your adrenal glands, your pancreas, your hypothesis. Compare it to an exocrine gland. What is an exocrine gland? Glands that release their secretions through ducts to a body cavity. Example, your sweat glands, your salivary glands. Please take note that your pancreas is both an endocrine and an exocrine gland because it releases or secretes hormones as well as digestive juices. Now, what are hormones? Hormones are chemical messengers. They can either stimulate, that means they increase or allow a reaction to occur, or they inhibit. Inhibit means to slow down or, in some cases, stop the secretion for a reaction. You also need to know the different endocrine glands in the body, where they are situated, as well as the hormones that they secrete. So let's get right into it. Here we have a diagram on the left with the, showing you the position of the different endocrine glands. And on the right, we give you the hormones that it secrete. You also need to know the functions of these different hormones. Our first endocrine gland is the hypothalamus, and that produces and secretes the hormone ADH. And what is ADH? It controls the water concentration in the blood. 
Our next gland, our pituitary gland, also known as our hypothesis, and if I can give you an indication, situated below the brain, and the pituitary gland or the hypothesis secretes a number of hormones. One of them, the growth hormone, responsible for growth in the body, growth of the skeleton, TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone that stimulates the thyroid gland to secrete thyroxin, FSH, we've done this hormone when we did the menstrual cycle, follicle stimulating hormone that stimulates the development of the follicles in the ovary, LH, stimulates ovulation and the formation of the corpus luteum, and then prolactin, the hormone responsible to stimulate the mammary glands to secrete milk. Then our next gland is our thyroid gland. Please make sure you know where it is situated on either side of the larynx here in the throat, and it secretes the hormone thyroxin. And please ensure that you know the basic functions of thyroxin is to control the basal metabolic rate in the body. Then we have our pancreas situated here. And the pancreas has specialized cells called the islets of Langerhans. And two hormones secreted by the pancreas, insulin and glucagon. And these two hormones control the blood glucose level. Please make sure you know which one, when the blood glucose levels are high, the body secretes insulin. When the blood glucose levels are low, the body secretes glucagon. Then we have our adrenal glands situated on top of the kidneys. And the adrenal gland secretes two hormones, adrenaline. Please ensure that you know the basic functions of adrenaline, as well as aldosterone that controls the salt concentration in the body. Then we have in females, our ovary is also an endocrine gland secreting estrogen and progesterone. In males, our testes, also known as an endocrine gland, secretes the hormone test. Testosterone. So very important, grade 12. Please make sure that you know the location of the endocrine glands, the hormones they secrete, as well as the general functions of each hormone. Right, then we get to the process of homeostasis. Now, what is homeostasis? Homeostasis is the process of maintaining a constant internal environment. But sometimes our body detects changes in this environment or an imbalance. Then we have a system that can restore this imbalance and that system is known as the negative feedback mechanism. It's a system that operates in the body to detect changes or any imbalances in the internal environment and to restore the balance so that homeostasis can be maintained. You should know and describe the negative feedback mechanism involving thyroxine, blood glucose levels, blood carbon dioxide levels, water balance, as well as salt balance. Let's look at our first homeostatic feedback mechanism between thyroxin and TSH. By now you should know thyroxin is secreted by the thyroid gland and TSH is secreted by the pituitary or the hypothesis gland. So let's look if there is an imbalance. If thyroxin levels are too high in the body, meaning the metabolic rate of the body is very high and you're going to lose weight. The pituitary gland is stimulated. Very important. You need to know there's a gland that detects it. So in this case, the pituitary gland is stimulated. 
to secrete less TSH. Please note the words in bold, less TSH. And TSH stimulates the thyroid gland to secrete less thyroxin. Thyroxin levels will decrease back to normal. Remember, we always want to maintain homeostasis. So this last line is very important to restore back to normal. Also know the opposite. If thyroxin levels are too low in the body, the pituitary gland is stimulated. And what would it do? Secrete more TSH. TSH stimulates the thyroid gland to secrete more thyroxin. Thyroxin levels increase back to normal. So please note the words in bold. They are very important. You cannot just say the pituitary secretes TSH. It's either less or more, depending on the imbalance that is detected. Right, let's have a look at the negative feedback of blood glucose levels. As mentioned before, Blood glucose levels is controlled by two hormones, insulin and glucagon, that are secreted by the islets of Langerhans in the pancreas. So if the blood glucose levels in the blood are too high after a meal, once again, what is the endocrine gland? Identify the gland. The pancreas is stimulated to secrete insulin and remember hormones are secreted directly into the blood insulin stimulates the conversion of glucose to glycogen that happens in the liver glucose level will decrease back to normal on the other side if glucose levels are too low you are very hungry Pancreas is stimulated to secrete glucagon. Glucagon goes to the target organ, the liver, and stimulates the conversion of glycogen to glucose. Glucose level increases back to normal. Please, grade 12, have a careful look at these three terms. Glucose, glycogen, glucagon. Candidates often confuse these terms. Remember, glucose are the sugar in the blood. Glycogen is converted. When glucose is stored, it is converted to glycogen and it is stored in this form. Glucagon is a hormone secreted by the pancreas. Our next negative feedback mechanism that we are going to look at is the regulation of carbon dioxide in the internal environment. And please note, you only need to know how our body reacts when CO2 levels are too high in the body. So when CO2 in the blood increases above normal, what happens? Receptor cells. Now, where are these receptor cells? In the carotid artery in the neck are stimulated. So they detect this high level of CO2 in the blood. They send an impulse to the medulla oblongata. Very important, you must be specific. It's not they send impulses to the brain, to the medulla oblongata in the brain. And the medulla oblongata sends or transmits two impulses. It stimulates the breathing muscles. And remember, our breathing muscles are either our intercostal muscles between our ribs and our diaphragm. And it also stimulates the heart. So if you are asked, name two organs that receive stimuli from the medulla oblongata that's stimulated by the medulla oblongata it's either the breathing muscles and the heart so what does the breathing muscles do they contract more actively and if they contract more actively it increases the rate and depth of breathing 
your heart beats faster due to the stimulus. More CO2 is taken from the cells, from the tissues, to the lungs to be exhaled. And the CO2 level in the blood returns to normal. Very, very important. What happens when there is an imbalance in water in your body? Remember, water balance is also known as osmo regulation. So when your blood has less water than normal, which gland is stimulated? Hypothalamus is stimulated. And please look at the use of the word. So the gland is stimulated. It sends impulses to the pituitary gland to secrete more ADH. And what is the function of ADH? It increases the permeability of the renal tubules. So the target organ of ADH are the renal tubules in the kidneys. And what does more ADH do? It increases the permeability of these tubules, meaning more water will be reabsorbed back into the blood from the renal tubules back into the blood. Please note the term, water is not absorbed, it is reabsorbed back into the blood. And your water level returns to normal. Now, when your body has more water than normal, the opposite happens. Once again, the hypothalamus is stimulated. It sends impulses to the pituitary gland to secrete less ADH. Very important, not just ADH, less ADH. ADH decreases the permeability of the renal tubules, meaning less water will be reabsorbed back into the blood and more water will be excreted by the kidneys and the water level returns to normal. We also need to know the regulation of salt in our body controlled by the hormone aldosterone that is secreted by the endocrine gland, the adrenal glands. So if your salt in the blood is too high, you've e eaten some nice salty chips, what happens? The adrenal gland is stimulated to stop secreting aldosterone. You're either going to stop it or you're going to secrete less aldosterone, depending on the salt content. So you can say the adrenal gland inhibits. Remember, inhibits is either to stop or less the secretion of aldosterone. Less salt is reabsorbed into the blood. Salt level decreases in the blood back to normal. And the opposite happens if the salt is too low. You also need to know the disorders caused by the imbalance in the levels of thyroxine. Remember, thyroxine is secreted by the thyroid gland and it controls the basal metabolic rate right and if you do not have iodine enough iodine it affects the production of thyroxine and that can lead to a greater which is the swelling of the thyroid gland you also need to know the disorder caused by blood glucose. If there's too much blood glucose that cannot be controlled, it leads to the disorder diabetes mellitus. Those are the only two disorders that you need to know at grade 12 level. Right, also part of negative feedback is the regulation of temperature. And regulation of temperature is known as thermal temperature regulation. Thermal regulation, yeah, you need to know the role of sweating. That is the sweat glands. And you need to know the role of the blood vessels. Whether they dilate, vasodilation, they become wider, or the blood vessels become narrower, 
vaso constriction. Vaso refers to blood vessels, dilation wider, constriction narrower. So let's look at the two scenarios that we have here. So on a hot day, meaning the temperature has increased, the hypothalamus is stimulated. Remember when we did the brain, the hypothalamus is responsible for the regulation of temperature in the body. So the hypothalamus detects this increase in temperature and it sends impulses. First impulse goes to the blood vessels below the skin. Have a look at the blood vessels here. So when the temperature increases, blood vessels dilate. What does dilate mean? They become wider. And this is called vasodilation. And if the blood vessels are wider, what effect does that have? More blood flows to the skin, meaning more heat is lost from the skin through evaporation and more blood is sent to the sweat glands. So now the sweat glands is also stimulated. So remember the hypothalamus sends two impulses, one to the blood vessels to dilate and one to the sweat glands. So more blood goes to the sweat glands, they become more active. And if the sweat glands become more active, there you can see more sweat is released. And the evaporation of the sweat cools the body down. So the temperature will go back to normal. And we know normal body temperature is 36.9 degrees Celsius. So what happens on a cold day? Once again, the hypothalamus is stimulated or the hypothalamus detects the decrease in temperature and sends two impulses. First impulse goes to the blood vessels and notice the size in the blood vessels. They become narrower, meaning they constrict and this is called vasoconstriction. And if the blood vessels are narrower, less blood flows to the skin, meaning less heat is lost from the skin. So body heat is maintained. The second impulse from the hypothalamus goes to the sweat gland. And the sweat gland is going to become less active. And if it's less active, meaning less blood flows to it, it's less active, less sweat is released. And that way we maintain body temperature. Right, let's have a look at some questions from past papers to consolidate what we've learned about endocrine systems and homeostasis. The diagram below represents part of the endocrine system in humans. So there's your clue. It's an endocrine system. So as before we look at the questions, let's look at the diagram and identify the gland situated below the brain. We should know is the pituitary gland or the hypophysis. There's not a label, but that would have been the thyroid gland. There I have my pancreas. On top of each kidney, I have my adrenal gland. And because this is male, D would indicate my testes. Let's have a look at the questions. 1.1.1 identify meaning you must just name a pituitary gland hypothesis one mark identify b adrenal gland c pancreas and that is three easy marks question 1.1.2 remember give the letter and the name of the gland that secretes a hormone responsible for starting puberty in males. Puberty in males is controlled, remember, by the hormone testosterone, but they don't want the name of the hormone. They want the letter 
and name of the gland that secretes testosterone. So it would be D, one mark, testis, one mark. Stimulate absorption of glucose by cells, meaning there's a high glucose content in the blood. It's an increase in glucose and you want to absorb that glucose. That would be insulin's job and insulin is secreted by C, the pancreas. Please be careful. Read your questions very carefully. Remember, they want the name of the gland, not the name of the hormone. So the gland that secretes um, insulin is C pancreas. That makes the kidney tumors permeable to water. We know that's ADH secreted by A, the pituitary gland or the high Hypothesis, a very easy question. And there we have our memo to that question 1.1. Our next question comes from a past paper as well. Let's read the stem. Very important because there's important information in this stem that is given to you. The diagram shows hormones involved in the homeostatic control of metabolism. So you should know metabolism we associate with the hormone type, roxin. So X is a gland found around the larynx in the neck. So if X is a gland in the larynx, already I know this is the thyroid gland. And I know X secretes which hormone, the arrow is going up, this hormone would be thyroxin. But X would only secrete thyroxin if it is stimulated by a gland that's coming from the hypothesis, and that is TSH. So let's have a look at the questions because we understand our diagram. Identify each of the following. A, the gland that secretes hormone A. So now we need to look at hormone A and we can see hormone A goes to my thyroid gland. So they want the gland, they don't want the hormone. So I know hormone A is TSH. So which gland secretes TSH? the pituitary gland or the hypothesis. Then they want to identify hormone B. And if I look at hormone B is going from a thyroid gland into the blood. So hormone B is thyroxin. Name the mechanism in the diagram that regulates the level of hormone B. What regulates the imbalance in these hormones? And the mechanism is my negative feedback mechanism. So now they say this is, we know this is the thyroid gland. Half of gland X was surgically removed in a person. State two possible effects that this would have on the secretion of the hormones referred to in the diagram above. They don't want the effects on the body. They want the effects on the secretion of the hormones. So if half of this is removed, less thyroxin will be secreted and more TSH will be secreted. Let's have a look at the answers. So less thyroxin and more TSH. Once again, read your question very carefully. They want the effects that this would have on the secretion of hormones, not the effect on the body. I will give you a few seconds to absorb. We go to our next question. The endocrine system plays a role in helping a person to cope during a dangerous situation. Here's my clue, dangerous situation. So I should know the hormone involved in my body in a dangerous situation, adrenaline. 
name the hormone that is secreted in the person's body in response to a dangerous situation. Remember the dangerous, we refer to the flight or fight hormone. So the hormone is called adrenaline. You cannot say the flight or fight hormone. State three effects that this hormone has on the body. They're talking about general effects. And remember, there are plenty. And yeah, you need to read carefully. They just said on the body. They could say that it has on the digestive system or on the blood system. So let's start from the top. We know pupils will dilate. You must just state and not explain. Pupils dilate. Heart beats faster, breathing increases. There are plenty. Let's have a look at it. You have an increase in heart rate, increase, increase in blood pressure. It stimulates the conversion of glycogen to glucose so that the body can have a faster respiration rate. Increases blood to the heart and the skeletal muscles. Decreases blood flow to the digestive system because you do not need that. You need to run away, so you need more blood in your skeleton muscles. It decreases blood flow to the skin because more blood needs to go to your muscles. It increases muscle tone, increases depth of breathing, increased rate of respiration, dilates or increases your pupils. Any three of those. But here, be very careful. Here, yeah, it was just very general on the body. They can say, state three effects that the hormone has on the heart. Then you're going to talk about the heart rate, the blood pressure. You're going to talk about um, blood supply to the heart. Let's have a look at the next question. Describe the homeostatic control of blood glucose in a person who consumed a drink with a large amount of sugar. So first of all, you should know a large amount of sugar. What effect is that going to have in, on the body? It's going to increase the blood glucose level. So how am I going to restore that? Let's have a look at that. So you need to mention blood glucose levels rise or you could say above normal the gland that stimulated is either the pancreas or very more specific the islands of langerans which are situated in the pancreas but pancreas will be accepted the hormone that it secretes it secretes insulin insulin travels in the blood to the liver and stimulates the absorption of glucose meaning Glucose is converted to glycogen, which decreases blood glucose levels to normal. Any five of those. So yeah, ensure that you know they're talking about there's an increase in blood glucose level. And what is the body going to do to restore that back to normal? Right, here we have a question on thermoregulation. The table below shows the average rate of blood flow. So here we have blood flow to the skin, the average rate of blood flow to the skin at different environmental temperatures. So an investigation was done and these were the results of the investigation. At zero degrees Celsius, the average blood flow was 2.5. And as you can see, as the temperature increased, the average rate of blood flow also increased. Give the environmental temperature at which there was the greatest average rate of blood flow to the skin. So if I look here, 2.5, 4, 4.5, 11, 18. So the greatest average was 19. At which temperature did that take place? 50 degrees Celsius. Describe the relationship between environmental temperature and the average rate of blood flow. 
So this one is dependent on that. That is the independent variable that we control. And this is the one that we measured. So how was this dependent? As the environmental temperature increase, the average rate of blood flow to the skin increase. And it's two marks or nothing. Question 3.2.3. Calculate the percentage increase in blood flow to the skin between 5 and 35 degrees. Now learners struggle to calculate percentage increase. So you go at 35, it was 11, you go to the highest, minus 4, Divide by the lowest one, divide by 4, and because it is percentage increase, times 100 to give you the percentage increase. So it is 11 at 35 minus 4, that was the rate at 5 degrees, divide by 4, that is 1 mark. Because we are calculating percentage increase times 100, and then very important, grade 12, that is why we need a calculator. Please make use of a calculator, and it is 175%. Question 3.2.4. Explain. Remember, what does explain mean? There must be a cause, an effect, a reason why it takes place. Explain the average rate of blood flow to the skin between 20 and 45. So between 20 and 45, you can see there was an increase in blood flow to the skin. Why would there be an increase in blood flow to the skin? So as the temperature increases, what effect does it have? Vasodilation occurs. Remember, the blood vessels dilate. And if the blood vessels dilate, what is the effect? you have more blood flows to the skin or you have an increase in the rate of blood flow but the easy one more blood flows to the skin and if more blood flows to the skin more heat is lost right our next question frostbite is a condition where long-term exposure to extremely cold conditions, meaning zero degrees or less, leads to the death of tissue in areas like the hands and feet, meaning less blood flows there. Use the data from the table to explain why tissue may die. So if you look at zero degrees, blood flow is very low. So meaning less blood flows to the skin, at zero and below zero, it's going to be even less. So less blood flows to the skin. And if less blood flows to the skin, more carbon dioxide will accumulate in the cells and they may die. Right, here we have a question on the regulation of water in the body. ADH plays a role in osmoregulation in the human body. And as we know, osmoregulation refers to the regulation of water. Name the gland that secretes ADH. So it's the hypothalamus, or they will accept the pituitary gland or the hypophysis. Describe osmoregulation on a cold day. On a cold day, remember, our body does not need so much water. So there'll be more blood, sorry, more water in the blood. So let's have a look at that. So water levels are higher than normal in the blood. Since less water is lost through sweating. Therefore, less or no ADH will be secreted meaning the renal tubules become less permeable to water, and if they're less permeable to water, less water is reabsorbed, meaning you will have more urine being produced. Question 233. A person with a medical condition that causes the renal tubules to become resistant, meaning they do not react to the effects of ADH, 
always produces large volumes of urine. Explain why the ADH levels in the blood will always be higher than normal for this person. So remember, if your body is resistant to ADH, water cannot be reabsorbed. Meaning your renal tubules are resistant, water levels are lower than normal in your blood, therefore more ADH. Your body is continuously going to secrete more ADH. Here's a very interesting question, also on osmoregulation. The diagrams below show the reabsorption of salt and water through the tubules of a nephron in the kidney under three different conditions. The width of the arrows represent the amounts of salt and water. And if you look at your key, the black arrow is salt and the gray arrow is water. So if you look here, this is the filtrate coming into the renal tubules and you can see salt as more salt is secreted but basically the same in diagram one in diagram two you can see more salt is reabsorbed less water is reabsorbed here you can see less salt is reabsorbed and more water is reabsorbed Right, let's have a look at the questions. Name the hormone in a human body that is responsible for controlling water content. That's basic knowledge, ADH. Salt content, aldosterone. Name the gland that secretes the hormone in question 311B. So which gland secretes aldosterone? The adrenal gland. Which diagram? So we have diagram 1, diagram 2, and diagram 3. And the examiner wants to see if you can interpret. Would represent a person who had eaten salty chips on a hot day. So if you're going to eat salty chips, the salt concentration in your body is going to be high in your blood. So do you want to reabsorb salt? No. So it would be the diagram that has the least reabsorption of salt and that would be diagram three explain your answer so how do we explain that the blood will have due to the chips remember you ate chips so the blood will have a high salt content therefore less or no aldosterone will be secreted resulting in less salt being reabsorbed in the blood but if you look at diagram three more water is reabsorbed meaning the blood will have less water than normal therefore more adh will be secreted making the kidney tubules more permeable more water will be reabsorbed this is really an application of your knowledge Right, our next question is on thermal regulation. The diagrams below represent structures in the skin of two people. So already there you, you, you have a clue. In the skin, skin has got to do with thermal regulation. If you look at person A, you can and you look there, it would be your sweat gland, that would be your blood vessel. And if you look at the size, here you can see they're very narrow. Here your blood vessels are very wide and sweat is secreted onto the skin. Both people were in the same room at the same time, but one person was exercising while the other was sitting still. The skin surface temperature of both people was measured after 10 minutes. Which person A or B was exercising? And we know when we exercise, we secrete sweat. So which person was exercising? Person B. Give two possible reasons for your answer. Sweat is secreted and the blood vessels have become wider. Name one hormone that should have the same effect on the blood vessel that is observed in person A. So if I look at A, A would be 
less blood flowing to the skin, which hormone will have an effect of less blood going to the skin? That would be your adrenaline. Remember the general effects of adrenaline that we had earlier on? After 10 minutes, the surface temperature of each person was measured. The results were as follows. So person A had a temperature of 37.2 and person B, remember after 10 minutes of exercising, person B had a temperature of 36.6. Explain why the skin temperature of person A was higher after 10 minutes. Why? Blood vessels are constricted or narrow and if they narrow, less blood goes to the skin. Less sweat is formed and less heat is lost. Or you can say more heat is retained. Another question on thermoregulation. The diagram below represents a part of the human skin. And once again, irrespective of how it is shown, That would be my sweat gland and that would be my blood vessel. Identify part B, so that would be the sweat gland. And remember, it's an exocrine gland, so it has ducts. And that would be my sweat pore through which the sweat is treated. Describe how structure A functions during thermal regulation on a cold day. So on a cold day, how would A function? It becomes narrower blood vessels there you can say it will constrict less blood flows to the surface of the skin less heat is lost and the temperature increases any three explain why temperature needs to be kept constant in the human body remember this is linked to grade 10 enzymes function optimally at normal body temperature which is 37. They will be denatured at high temperatures or they become inactive at low temperatures. And then once again, I need to bring your attention to your exam guideline that tells you in detail what you need to study for the endocrine system and homeostasis for endocrine system. And we've been through this. Make sure you know the difference between an endocrine and an exocrine gland. You need to know what a hormone is. You need to know the location, the names and the functions of the different hormones. You need to know what homeostasis is and the negative feedbacks that we've done of each one of these. And then once again, use your exam guidelines effectively for consolidation of topics. Responding to the environment plants and as you know this topic is part of paper 1 and makes up 13 of the 150 marks in paper 1. Now what do we need to know for this topic? Firstly we need to know the three different plant hormones, auxins, gibberellins and abscisic acid as well as the general functions of these hormones. Auxins we know promotes growth. Promotes, it stimulates cell division, it stimulates cell elongation, and in that way it promotes growth. It also plays a role in tropic movements. You remember, tropic movements is the movements of plants in response to an external stimulus. Auxins are also involved in apical dominance. Gibberellins are responsible for the germination of seeds and it stimulates the growth of side branches. And then our third hormone that we need to know is abscisic acid. This inhibits cell division. It also inhibits the germination of seeds in cold winter months. If we look at the role of auxins in tropisms, remember tropism in general, it refers to the growth movement of a plant in response to an external stimulus. So if the stimulus is light, we call it phototropism. If the stimulus is gravity, we refer to it as geotropism. 
So the role of auxin in phototropism, remember auxins are produced at the tip of the stem and the shoot, meaning in the apical meri stem. From there, auxins move downward evenly in the plant. So even distribution brings about equal growth on all sides of the stem. As a result, the stem will grow upward. But when your stem is exposed to unilateral light, uni, one-sided light, meaning light is coming from one side only, the auxins concentration will be high on the dark side because auxins are light sensitive and move away from the light. So the dark side would have a high concentration of auxins. More cell division, cell elongation takes place on the darker side. Therefore, growth is stimulated on the darker side. And as a result, the stem bends towards the light. If you look at the role of auxins in geotropism, remember geotropism refers to the movement of plants in response to gravity. Remember, auxins are produced at the tips of the root where they move upwards evenly. And an even distribution bring about equal growth on all sides of the root. As a result, roots grow downward. But when a root is placed horizontally, meaning on its side, so only one side is exposed to gravity. The auxin concentration will be higher on the lower side of the root, meaning gravity attracts auxins. So mo growth occurs on the upper side of the root because auxins on the lower side inhibit growth. As a result, the root bends downwards. We also need to know that plants are eaten by herbivores and attacked by pathogenic organisms such as viruses, bacteria and fungi, causing them to become diseased. So how does the plant protect themselves, either by chemicals or thorns. Let's have a look at some questions. The diagram below represent the growth responses of two different plant organs to external stimuli and here we can see it's going upwards and towards the one side. Here it is horizontal and it grows downward. Name the group of plant hormones responsible for the growth responses observed in the diagram. Remember, we just have three hormones in grade 12. Auxins, gibberellins, and abscisic acid. Which one causes tropic movement? Auxins. Name the stimulus at A. It's coming from one side, growing towards it. Light. The stimulus at D. Gravity, because it's growing downward. Give one observable reason, meaning observable, you can see it on the diagram. Why plant organ B is a stem? It grows towards the light. It is positively phototropic. Explain the growth response observed in plant organ C. So remember, if a plant is placed horizontally, the concentration of auxins on the lower side is higher. So there you have a lower concentration. High concentration of auxin on the lower side inhibit growth, meaning that upper side will grow faster and the root would bend towards gravity. And there we have our answers. Our next question Describe the role of auxins in phototropism when a plant is exposed to unilateral light, meaning light from one side. And as we can see, auxins move away from light. Auxins are light sensitive. So if light comes from one side, it moves away from the light. 
So there's a higher concentration of auxins on the darker side of the stem where growth is stimulated or cell division or cell elongation is stimulated. The dark side grows faster, causing the stem to grow or bend towards the light source. Here we have another interesting question on plant hormones. A clinostat, this is the clinostat, is a device used to investigate plant growth responses. It has a disc, so there you have a disc that rotates very slowly when the clinostat is switched on. So during an investigation on plant responses to light, so here you have a box, the procedure below was followed. We had three pot plants of the same species we use. Each plant was placed on one of three identical clinostats. Each set of apparatus A, B and C was placed in a box with a single opening. Each clinostat was treated in a different way over a period of five weeks. The results of the investigation are represented in the diagrams below. So here I have my results, three plants, one plant, one growing up and one growing towards the light. Name the plant growth response to light, phototropism. State two factors that were kept constant during the investigation. So I go here to my procedure. Same species were used. It was placed on identical clinostats. They had a box with a single opening, and you can see the opening is on the similar position, and they did it for five weeks. Give one reason why the results of this investigation may be considered to be unreliable. What increases reliability of the results when you do it more than once? So this was only done once, and it was a small sample. They only used one plant per investigation. Which apparatus was the clinus switched on and rotating very slowly? Must have been B because the effect of phototropism was excluded. It grew upwards. The clinus stat was switched off but manually rotated through 180 degrees once a week. That would be A. Explain the effect of unilateral light, light coming from one side, on the distribution of auxins. So auxins move away from the light. The dark side will have a higher concentration of auxins and the light side would have a less concentration of auxins. And there we have our answers to the previous question. We have another question on plant hormones. A group of learners conducted an investigation to determine the effect of auxins on the growth of stems in bean seedlings. So when you get something like this, here they're giving you the aim of the experiment or the investigation to determine that it should be your clue. What must you determine? The effect of auxins, which is your independent variable, on the growth of stems. So the growth of stems is dependent on auxins. So I have my two variables, auxins and the growth of stems. The procedure was as follows. They used 30 bean seeds were allowed to germinate for five days to produce seedlings. The seedlings were divided into three groups. The tips of all the seedlings were cut at the same length. In group A, the cut tip was placed back. There you can say so it was cut off, placed back. In group B, the tip was not placed back. And in C, they put a piece of plastic on top of the cut surface and then the tip was placed back. The seedlings were placed in a dark habit for a week and the growth of the stem was then observed. And if we look now, there was some growth there, no growth and very little 
รอไอดีนติฟายเดอะดิเพนเดนต์วาริเอบิลรีเมมเบอร์ยูโกทูยูเอ็มดิเอฟเฟกต์ออฟออกซอนส์ออนเดอะกรอทออฟสเตมส์สมัยดิเพนเดนต์วาริเอบิลส์ออนเดอะกรอทออฟสเตมส์วายดิเธอเลิร์นส์คัทเดอะจับส์ออฟเดอะยังสเตมส์อับเวียสลีทูรีมูฟเดอะซอร์สออฟออกซอนส์คุณรีเมมเบอร์ออกซอนส์ออกเคอร์แอตเดอะทับออฟสเตมส์ 343, give one reason why 10 seedlings were used in each group. Remember, the larger the sample, to increase reliability of the results. Write down the letters A, B, or C, where there will be no upward growth of the stem. And there you can see in B and C, there's no upward growth. That is the original tip that was placed back, so there was no growth. Describe how auxins cause apical dominance, meaning the tip becomes dominant in the presence of auxins. So the presence of auxins in the tip stimulate upward growth, and it inhibits the growth of lateral branches. So while auxins are at the tip, it will inhibit or stop lateral branches from growing, and that phenomenon is known as apical. Dominance. Name the plant hormone other than auxins that promotes the germination of seeds, gibberellins, that inhibits the germination of seeds, abscisic acids. And then once again, if you look at your exam guideline, very short and concise, responding to the environment plants, paper 1, 13 marks. You need to know the general functions of auxins, gibberellins, and abscisic acid. You need to know the role of auxin in geo and phototropism, how auxins are used to control of weeds. You also need to know that the plant de defends itself by using two mechanisms, either by using chemicals or by using thorns. Success doesn't come to you, grade 12. You go to it. All the best for your exam preparation for your final exams. And once again, extra resources for this topic can be found at the following link.